All right, if y'all would, open in your Bible to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. We're going to continue our look at uh, some of the evidence from archaeology and how it assists us in uh, understanding the Word of God. And uh, so in Luke chapter 20, <coughs> I went too far, in verse number 28, there is a question. We'll go ahead and begin in verse 27. Luke uh, 20 and verse 27. There came unto him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us. Now that's what we're going to talk about uh, concerning archaeology in just a moment. But notice they said that Moses wrote unto us. If any man's brother die having a wife, and he die without children, then his brother should take up his wife and raise up seed to his brother. I'm going to pause there because we don't need to read any further into the context. The word that we're focusing our attention upon right now is that word wrote. Moses wrote. Uh, for centuries, people attacked the Bible and one of the things that they said is that there was no written language at the time of Moses. Therefore, Moses didn't write the first five books of the Bible. And then, of course, and we talked about this, oh, I don't know, maybe two or three months ago, they came up with a theory called the documentary hypothesis. And in that theory, they came up with, they thought, five different individuals that they said actually wrote the book, uh, the books, uh, the first five books of the Bible. And uh, for years, that was taught in uh, our higher education. If you went to universities uh, in higher education, they would say Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible. But then in 1928, a Syrian farmer uncovered a slab of stone while he was plowing his field and I'm not sure how they would say this, Rosh Shamra, uh, which is Arabic for fiddlehead, uh, and it identified this area as the ancient Phoenician city of Europe, uh, of Ugarit, Ugarit. And so one of the men that worked on this uh, said, uh, and I got those out of order, um, I do believe, yes, uh, let's see. Uh, so, how did I get that out of order? Because that doesn't look right at all. Anyway, uh, he says that scarcely a month had gone by. I know that's right. I'm just not picking up on it. He said scarcely a month had gone by. Now this is 1928 before one of the most important discoveries of the century was made. Uh, this was the uncovering of a scribal school and library adjoining a temple. This is in the area. This man's plowing, plies up this tablet. They start doing archaeological digs, and he says within a month, they had found a temple, they had found a library, and they had found a scribal school. And he goes on to say most of the tablets, and notice that is indeed plural, most of the tablets in the library were written in a strange new script. Now remember, this is 1928. So they find it. They find this script. They don't recognize it for what it was. But it's, he says that they soon were deciphered by uh, Semitic scholars, one of whom had been decorated by the French government for the brilliant work that he did on enemy cipher in the first, four, uh, the first World War. So the tablets were dated around 1400 to 1200 B.C. And that indicates that it is indeed possible that Moses could write. And uh, this dispels this idea that there were no written language. I didn't go any further into this, but they have now uncovered even more ancient writings than this 1400 B.C., and that, of course, predates. But now think about this. This is about the time that Moses was writing the first five books of the Bible, and uh, 
they already had libraries and they already had schools where they were training men to write in this uh, language uh, that when they found it, they didn't even know what it was. So uh, again, this is where we find archaeology absolutely proves that the Bible is right. And in Luke 20 and verse 28, when they asked Jesus, they said, now Moses wrote, he absolutely could write. And we have definitive proof that they were already writing 1,400 years before the time of Christ. Uh, the problem that we see is that men want to reject the Bible. That's what they want. And they're going to grasp at any straw to try to come up with a reason for rejecting the Word of God. And so they would say that, well, Moses couldn't write. They didn't have a written language during the time of Moses. And yet now we know that it's not true. They did have written languages. They did have libraries. They did have schools where they were training people to write, even at the time of Moses. Uh, you go back and you look at the Egyptian culture, which Moses was raised in, and they wrote with hieroglyphics. They, they, what we would call word pictures, they would actually draw a picture and it would, uh, it would symbolize a word, much like you see some of the Native American writings uh, that are written in pictograph. Uh, just because it's not a language that we recognize doesn't mean that they couldn't read and write in the time of Moses. But again, the point that they want us to think is, well, Moses, they weren't even writing at that time. You know what is so frustrating? The documentary hypothesis is still taught in major universities across America right now. Even though it has been disproved, there is ample proof that Moses could have written the first five books of the Bible because they already had several written languages. Humankind already had several different languages at the time that Moses was alive. It's just another one of those efforts to try to disprove the Bible, and yet archaeology shows us that this is absolutely false. But I, again, I want to stress that they are still teaching the documentary hypothesis in higher education in the United States today. Even though it's been proved, what, 100 years now? Almost? That they had a written language even before the time of Moses? It's amazing to me that we have this kind of problem in the United States. And that's one of the problems that we have. So uh, any thoughts about that before we move on to our actual lesson? Yes, ma'am. Isn't evolution still taught in our schools? Absolutely. It's been disproven a long time ago? Yes, and they would, of course, say it hasn't been disproven, but uh, many of the uh, examples that they use, they've shown them to be false. Many of the examples of evolution that are put into textbooks in our school systems have been proven to be wrong and yet they still use them today some of them have been proven to be wrong for over a hundred years and yet they still put them in school books across america it's frustrating to me let god be true and every man alive that's right that's right anything else all right so uh, let's notice and we'll begin in uh Matthew chapter, no, let's go to Luke chapter 18 since we're already in the book of Luke and since Luke is writing his account of the gospel uh, in uh, chronological order. So we'll go to Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> Luke chapter 18 and we'll begin our reading in verse number 32. No, 31. And uh, this is where Jesus foretells his death, burial, and resurrection. And I say burial, he talks about his death and his <coughs> resurrection. So, verse 31, He took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that were written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. Now, I want to I pause there before we go any further into the text, and I want you to notice that Jesus actually takes the twelve aside and He's preparing them 
for that time when they get to Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen. So that tells us if we're going through the biblical timeline that we are now, even though we're in uh, Luke chapter 18 and there's several more chapters in the book of Luke, we are down to the final days of Jesus. He says we're going to Jerusalem and when I get there, he says everything that was written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So verse 32, he continues by saying, He shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on and they shall scourge him and put him to death and the third day he shall rise again. What's sad is verse 34. They understood none of these things and this saying was hid from them Neither knew they the things which were spoken. So what does verse 34 tell us? They didn't understand. They didn't understand. And you know, uh, you might, and, and, and I liken this to, uh, you know, things that have happened in our lives. Uh, you know, uh, when, it come time, when it comes time for a loved one to pass. And, and you know that the time is there. I mean, all the indications are there. You know that it's getting close to that time, and yet we don't want to accept it. And then when the person passes, then we look back and we say, you know, it's probably for the better. The signs were all there. We just weren't accepting the signs. And so it's difficult for us to hear bad news and process that bad news, internalize that bad news, and act upon it. And that's what I see in the apostles at this point. They hear Jesus say that, they don't want to accept it. They don't want to accept it as being true. Did they realize that he was speaking of himself? I mean, he's talking in the third person. Yes, and, and I think so because he uses that term to describe himself, son of man, uh, quite often, of course, you, you can go back and you can notice uh, some of the Old Testament prophets use that terminology. Ezekiel talked about himself as the son of man. So uh, I think they did, but it may have been a little bit of a curveball. Uh, maybe they weren't expecting him to make that statement. So that could have been part of it, that he moved to the third person. He used the term son of man. But uh, it's uh, a little bit hard for us to comprehend why didn't they get it. Let's turn now to the book, book of Mark. And we'll go to Mark chapter 10. And we'll begin our reading in verse 32. Mark 10 in verse 32. Now notice, it says, and they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. What's the little bit, uh, little bit added into that statement? They're, they're, they're moving to Jerusalem. When we read about it in Luke, the, it seems that they're getting ready to move, but this says they are on their way. They're on their journey to the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them. Now that's something that uh, Dr. Luke didn't mention. That Jesus is a little bit ahead of them. And as they followed, they were afraid. And He took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto Him, saying, We go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered to the chief priests, and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and uh, they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. So Mark mentions they're on their journey to go to Jerusalem. Jesus is a little bit ahead of them. They catch up, or he slows down. They come together and Jesus tells them 
Now notice Mark doesn't mention the fact that they don't understand what he's talking about. Luke did, and Mark did not. So let's now turn to Matthew uh, chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And again, this is an indication that we are now getting toward uh, the final days of Jesus Christ life here on this earth. And I don't really think we want to go to Matthew 20, verse 127. I think we want to just go to verse 27. What do y'all think? Verse 127 through 20 through 19. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, I got fat fingers when I type. So Matthew 20, we'll begin, I'm thinking probably, uh, let me even see now that I've got it right. 17? Uh, yep, 17. So there's something in there that's right. There's just a two in the way. So Matthew 20, verse 17. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief <coughs> priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. So Jesus is preparing his disciples for that time when he is going to go to Jerusalem and to die. And of course we know, and uh, we're not going to take the time to turn over there, but you remember that in John chapter 13, and, and uh, this will be something we'll mention a little bit later on, but in John chapter 13, Jesus is about to participate in the feast of the Passover. He washes his disciples' feet. And then, beginning in Mark chapter, or excuse me, John chapter 14, Jesus reminds them that their heart should not be troubled, they believe in God, believe also in Him. You know how that goes. And Jesus continues that teaching all the way through John chapter 17. So we get a glimpse of some of the things that Jesus was telling the disciples at this moment before He is going to go to the city of Jerusalem and be uh, mocked, scourged, and crucified. So Jesus foretells His death. Matthew 20, 17 through 19, Mark 10, 32 through 34, and then Luke 18, 31 through 34. Any thoughts before we move to the next point? And notice how these woven together gives us a fuller picture, a fuller picture of what was going on at this moment. So now we're going to skip forward a little bit, but we're going to notice Jesus' entry uh, into the city of Jerusalem. And I want to go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We'll begin in Luke's account. You remember that in Luke chapter 19, before you get to the point where Jesus talks about His, uh, tri or when we read about His triumphant entry, we find that Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus. He teaches the parable of the pounds. And then in Luke 19 and verse 28, we read that when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. Now we've talked about the geography of the Bible on several occasions. And it is accurate to describe you go up to the city of Jerusalem because Jerusalem was built upon a mountain. As a matter of fact, there were seven peaks in the, the city of Jerusalem, uh, around the city of Jerusalem and the, the area right around it. There were seven different mountain peaks. And so Jesus would go up. You know, it's kind of like you hear people say, well, I, went, I walked to school barefoot and I went up, and it was uphill both ways. Well, you know, that is possible if you go through a valley. You're going to go down and you're going to go up and go to school and then you come back and you go down and up again. So it is possible. I don't know that that's what our grandparents were talking about when they said that, but it is possible to go up both ways if there's a valley between where you're going. And there is a valley between where Jesus is going. So he goes up to, the Bible says, he ascends to Jerusalem. 
Verse 29. It came to pass that he, when he was uh, when he was come nigh to Bethphagia and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering in you shall find a cold tide whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus ye say unto them, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. And uh, they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, so he leaves the Mount of Olives, he goes down to the bottom of that valley. Now he's going to ascend up to the city of Jerusalem. So it says uh, that on the descent of the Mount of Olives, now watch this, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto them, Master, rebuke thy disciples. He answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. There's a lot packed into what Luke says here. So let's break it down and think about it. First of all, we get the information. Well, I tell you what, before we do that, let's look at the other accounts. Let's try to tie it all together. So let's go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. It says in verse 12, John 12 and verse 12, on the next day, you remember what had happened the day before in John 12 and verse 1, Mary is going to anoint Jesus and uh, it is uh, anointing of oil and it is, I believe, a prediction, and I don't know that uh, Mary actually realized this, of his death. But she uses the precious ointment uh, to wipe his feet, his hands, uh, and of course you remember Judas is uh, upset about it and said, uh, why is she blowing all that money? We could use that to save the poor. But of course, uh, he really wanted to get his hand in the bag is what it was, verse 6. But in verse 12, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees. This is why it's called Palm Sunday. Took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet Him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And, when Jesus, and Jesus, when He had found a young ass, set thereon as it is written. Now, notice that Luke gave us a lot more information about this donkey. Where did it come from? Well, Jesus sent two of His disciples into a village and said, you're going to find a colt there that's tied. Nobody's ever sat on it. Bring it to Me. As John gives it to us, he just says that Jesus gets on the donkey, the colt, and uh, starts riding it. Uh, and as He's riding it, 
they that sat there said in verse 15, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's coat. And you remember, of course, that this was a prediction of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse number 9 that the Messiah would actually enter into Jerusalem not on some great mule, and that's what the, the Jewish kings were kind of favored was these big, uh, you know, mules. I uh, talked about it before. My dad had a, an Appaloosa mare, registered Appaloosa mare, mare, and she was about 16 and a half hands high. She was a big, beautiful mare. We had a guy just down the street about a mile who had a, a, a jack, and he asked my dad, can, can we cross this and see what we get? Well, they did that three times, and they had some of the biggest most beautiful mules you've ever seen. I mean, they were just gorgeous. I think I mentioned this. I, I, I was talking to a guy a while back. Uh, it may have even been at Daddy's funeral three years ago. And, and I asked him, I said, do you remember those mules? Uh, the guy's name was Dink McFall. I said, do you remember those mules that Daddy and Dink crossed? And he said, yeah. He said, because I worked on one, he said that rascal was 1,200 pounds. So that tells you how big the mule was, and uh, they they actually got three of them. And uh, Dink trained them for coon hunting. I don't know if I told that part of it, but they they would coon hunt, and he trained those mules. He would actually lay a blanket over the fence, and those mules would jump the fence. But if he didn't put a blanket on it, they wouldn't jump the fence. And so when they would go coon hunting, the fence didn't mean anything. They'd just throw a blanket over it, and the mule would jump over it, and they'd keep right on coon hunting. So they did a lot of coon hunting on those mules, but they were massive, large mules. And that's what the kings of Israel favored, these big, muscular mules. And they would ride in. And here Jesus enters as the king, verse 15, riding upon the colt of a donkey. What does that indicate? Humility. His humility. That, that is a statement of His humility. Now Luke, or excuse me, John tells us in verse 16, these things understood not his disciples at the first. So they didn't understand all that's going on at the first, the Bible says. But when Jesus was glorified, that's talking about his uh, ascension into heaven, then remembered they the things which were written of him, and they that had done these things unto him. So John tells us that when Jesus is glorified, He ascends to heaven, what is the next event that takes place in Acts chapter 1? Jesus ascends, and what happens? They go into Jerusalem, and in Acts 2, the Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2. So I, I think that this partially is a statement that the Holy Spirit is bringing to remembrance and that's John 14 and verse 26 and John 16. I don't remember the verse in John where the Holy Spirit would bring to their remembrance everything that Jesus had said and done. So now Jesus, when He's glorified, they remember these things. By the way, it's why we know that John is writing about these events not as they happen, but later through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and He's giving us this information. Well, the disciples didn't remember it at that time, and John's included in that. Uh, but they would remember everything that was said and done about the Christ. Now notice verse 17, and we're going to find some additional information. Why so many are following Christ at this time? Why is there such a following at this moment? It says, the people, therefore, that were with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause, the people also met him, for they had heard that he had done this miracle. So why were the crowds primed for Jesus when he enters into the city of Jerusalem to anoint him, willing to anoint him as king over them. Seen the they had seen the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And the people are all talking about Jesus raising this man from the dead. And so that means the crowds have multiplied greatly 
because this great miracle that had been done and talked about, and so now people are ready. He's the king. He's riding into the city of Jerusalem. Palm Sunday, we're laying out our clothes and the palm trees to pave the way of the anointing of the king of Israel. And then, verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. So what is the Pharisees' assessment? We don't stand a chance. Everybody's following Jesus now. And so, there were certain, verse 20, of the Greek among them that came up to worship at the feast. And the same came therefore to Philip, which was a Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. What a great statement. And by the way, that ought to be the motto for all of us. We want to see Jesus. And when we come in contact with people, we ought to be uh, showing them the things of Jesus. And it says, Philip again cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. So John gives us a little bit more detail, fleshes out some things that we haven't seen before. So now let's go to Mark chapter 11. And then we'll try to weave it all together, if I can remember it all. Mark 11 and verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto Bethphagia and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent the four two of his disciples and said, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you've entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do you do this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send you hit, or send him hither. And they went their way, found the colt tied by the door, without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. So uh, Mark gives us just a little bit more detail. There's a fork in the road, and that's where they find the colt. So there's a fork in the road. They find the colt, and they loose him. Certain of them that stood by said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and others kept cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that followed went before, and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked round about upon all these things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. So a little bit more information. He goes into the city of Jerusalem. The people are there uh, calling him the king. Notice that they said, as we read just a moment ago, blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So they're looking for a restoration of that kingdom. But then the Bible tells us Jesus went into the city. He went into the temple. He looked around. But then he goes back to the village of Bethany. It's going to be important as we continue along. Yes, ma'am. Well, in Mark 9, 1 is where he says, and there's some standing here that will not taste of death till they see the kingdom come. Yes, yes. Power. That's exactly right. So let's go now to Matthew chapter 21. And we'll read Matthew's account. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, were come to Bethphagia and unto the Mount of Olives, they sent, uh, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you, found, you shall find an ass and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. What additional information is there? Now you've got the mayor. Now you've got the mama. You've got the, the female and the colt. And they bring both of them to Jesus. And all this was done, verse 4, 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, watch this, meek and sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. As we said a moment ago, this is a prophecy of Zechariah 9 and verse 9. So let's go ahead and turn to Zechariah chapter 9. And notice the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse number 9. Zechariah 9 and verse number 9. And by the way, that gives us an indication of what Zechariah is writing about, does it not? He's talking about the restoration of the kingdom, not that kingdom that uh, they were expecting when they left Babylonian captivity. That's what Zechariah is talking about, that 70 years of captivity, and they come back. Well, that's not what Zechariah is pointing to at this point. Maybe a part of it, but there's a deeper fulfillment. So it says in Zechariah, Zechariah 9 and verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, or excuse me, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So here we see Jesus fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, which was a prophecy of Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem. That's what that prophecy was about. So it says back to Matthew 21 and verse 6, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded and brought the ass and the coat and put on them their clothes and they set him their own and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down up branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. <laughs> Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, now I'm going to pause there. They recognized, I think, that this was a fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. They've seen the great miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead. The people are all ablaze talking about him raising Lazarus. And now he comes to the city of Jerusalem and he's riding upon this donkey and he's reminding them this is what the Bible says. This is that Old Testament prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9. So the people at this point are ready to acknowledge him as their king. And it says in verse 10, And when he was come into this Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. So that's Jesus' triumphant entry. By the way, as you continue reading in, John, uh, in Matthew 21, it says in verse 12, Jesus went into the temple of God. Well, we just read from Mark's account, that's not going to happen until the next day. So some of this is compressed. Some of it's very specific. But it said in Mark that Jesus went into the temple, into Jerusalem, into the temple, looked around, and then he left and went back, back to Bethany. So this is the conclusion of the Lord's day. This was the first day of the week. And so Jesus entered into Jerusalem on what we would call a Sunday. And He goes into the city. People put all the straws on the way. He goes into the temple. He looks around and then He leaves. So that's the Lord's day. It's not the Lord's day at that time. It's the first day of the week. But that event transpired on the first day of the week. So we get this indication of Jesus' triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. So Lord willing... Next Wednesday night, we will come back and we will see the cleansing of the temple. And remember, we've already put that now as this is the first day of the week, so he cleanses the temple the second day of the week, which is Monday. All right, any thoughts, questions, or comments? And then he dies on a Friday? <laughs> uh, I think he died on Thursday. 
That's my and, and well. Anyway, it was that same week. Yes. And also, what you're talking about going up to the house of the Lord's house in Jerusalem it uh -huh. also fulfills Isaiah two, because it says in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it, and many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of of God, of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. And that happened in Acts 2. Yes, that's exactly right. That's a, that is fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. All right, so uh, any thoughts before we wrap up this, this uh, weaving of these together? I, I hope that it's... Uh, made some sense as we're looking at it, uh, trying to bring all these together to see the events as they transpire. There's a lot of background uh, that is fulfilled or that is filled in by all the writers. So Jesus goes to the cities of Bethphagia and Bethany, goes to the Mount of Olives, goes down, and then, and I don't know exactly when he sends the disciples to get the donkey, but they go get the donkey and then he rides that donkey into the city of Jerusalem and uh, that's where they start strawing the way. And uh, the crowds, as we said a moment ago, were ready because Jesus had raised Lazarus and they were still talking about it, so there were massive crowds. The Pharisees even said, the whole of Jerusalem's following him. Uh, we, don't, we don't stand a chance. And then, just a few days later, what are those crowds going to say? Crucifying. Crucifying. And uh, I remember Brother Mac Deaver saying, never underestimate the fickleness of human beings. They can go from one day, this is our king, to the next day, or the next few days, crucifying, crucifying. You know, that's why fame is so fleeting, is it not? People want to, they want to get their fame and fortune, but how do we usually describe that? What do we call it? They got their... 30 seconds. Well, I, 15 minutes of fame is the way I've always heard it. They got their 15 minutes of fame. Uh, and that's about the way it is. And, uh, you know, these people that want to be popular from the time they're... 12 until the time that they're 90, they're in for a rude awakening. And yet, that seems to be what many people in America are wanting. I got to get my, I got to get on flip flop or whatever it is and, and put something out there so everybody will see it and come running. And, and uh, boy, I'll be famous and I'll get rich. And they don't realize the same people that are patting you on the back today will stab you in the back tomorrow. And that's what we see with the life of Christ, and we see it all around us. But especially as we're looking at the life of Christ. He's our King. We're going to anoint Him. You remember at one point as we were studying, they were going to actually take Him by force and make Him their King. And He slipped out and didn't allow it because the time was not right. But I didn't think that all the people wanted Him crucified. I thought it was the Jews pushing the Romans to do it. Yes, but you remember when when uh, when Pontius Pilate asked, "What do we do with him?" The crowds cried, "Crucify him!" And he said, I, "I find no reason. There's no reason." And and they said, "Well, his blood can be upon us and upon our children." So it was the it was the Jewish crowds that were crying, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" It was mob violence. It it, it was. I mean, it, it's always. I don't want to say always, but you, you look and uh, you get a crowd worked up and you they will, it's unbelievable. That's why when people were talking about they were so, so shocked by the riots. When you get crowds together and you get them pumped up about some cause, they'll burn down their own mm -hmm. mother's house and never think a thing about it. It's amazing to me. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was, uh, 
it was the, the leaders of the people, but uh, also uh, the people themselves cried out for him to be crucified. The Jewish crowds cried out for him to be crucified. I'm trying to think of where that is. Uh, I know probably John 19 might mention it. Uh, Well, <laughs> instigators. There's some instigators, and it doesn't matter. They could be one person that has a little influence, and it starts just spreading. Yes. Quickly. Yes. John 1837 is where power talks to me. I, I'm looking for the verse where they cried out crucifying. Mark 15 and verse 13. Because I, I want that verse to be a, a part. Mark 15, uh, it says, Pilate, verse 12, Mark 15 and verse 12, answered and said again, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out, Crucify him. And then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him, crucify him. Verse 15, So Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus. And when he had scourged him to be crucified, uh, so uh, yes, the Jewish leaders, but the people are also crying out for him to be crucified. Uh, it's not just, the, not just the leaders, it's everybody. That's why Peter would say in Acts chapter 2, you by wicked hands are crucified and slain. And he was talking to the common man. All right, anything else? Yeah, verse 11. Okay, verse 11. Mark 15, 11. Yes. That's where the crowd was stirred into a mob. The chief priest moved the people. Yes, good point. So that's where it, it indicates it's not just the leaders, it's the people being motivated. And that's why we said the fickleness of a crowd, uh, you know, uh, I don't like crowds. I'll be real honest with you. I don't like to go where there's a bunch of people and you get all crowded up because you don't know what's going to happen. So anyway, we'll talk about that more as we move into this study because we're getting close to the end. Anything else? All right. So as we wind down tonight, I want you to think about this. It's very easy to convince people of something that's false and something that's wrong. And you can whip up a crowd and convince them to do just about anything. And that's one of the reasons that Moses would write, and yes, I said Moses would write, he did write in Exodus 23 and verse number 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Don't get caught up into these movements that are going around and, and, and trying to take us away from the Bible. So uh, this evening, if you're not a child of God, we pray that you'll just be obedient to Jesus Christ as we've said, <coughs> I don't know how many times, Mark 16 and verse 16, the one who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And so uh, if you've never obeyed the gospel, Brother Brett's going to lead us in this song. As a child of God, if you have a need, please come as we stand and as we sing. <coughs>